This episode is sponsored by Linode. Do you need a Linux server for your latest creation? Then check them out. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit per second network connections, Intel E5 processors, and top of the line hardware to run your servers on. It deploys Linux in seconds from a Linode cloud, and you can choose your Linux distribution and node location right from the manager. They have locations in Asia, North America, and Europe, and a suite set of tools to make it easy to manage it. If the web interface isn't your thing, they also have an API and a command line. They also provide two-factor authentication, IPv6, DNS manager, plumbing, scaling, and everything else you would want. So get the most out of your Linux node by checking them out at linode.com or devchat.tv slash linode. Hello, welcome to React Native Radio, episode 80, 85. I'm your host, Nader Dabit. Today on our panel, we have Spencer Carley. Hello, hello. And our special guest uh, today again is Mike Grabowski. Mike, welcome back to the show. Hello, everyone. How's it going today? Uh, pretty well. So you just kind of, uh, so this is our first show really of 2018. And um, we brought Mike on the show. Uh, Mike has been on here a few times. We've done a couple of these shows where we kind of just have a d general discussion. And I think this is going to be kind of a general discussion about things that happened in 2017 and things that we kind of see um, happening in, in the industry around React Native and what we are expecting in 2018. And just uh, nothing really, really solid as far as like the topic. We're just going to have like kind of a general discussion about kind of uh, about what we've seen, uh, you know, last year and this year, but just a general discussion about React Native in general. So um, I guess to kind of kick things off, um, Mike, you've been doing the releases for uh, React Native for uh, how long now? Oh my God, I don't remember. Uh, but it's going to be like more than a year, like around two years probably. <laughs> Yeah, um, so a couple of years. Yeah. So, like, what, yeah. what have you seen kind of change as far as the release cycle? I know that we, we uh, you kind of moved from releasing, like, every two weeks to every month. Is that kind of still going on right now? Uh, yeah. So, so, so obviously, the first thing that did change is the release sort of momentum from being bi-weekly to once a uh, sorry, bi-monthly to be just once a month. Uh, I would say that, you know, like, the when we compared the releases that, that did happen, like, a year ago or maybe two years ago with what we have right now, uh, in my opinion, the, the state of React Native is definitely better as far as, for example, breaking changes. Uh, I used to have apps that, that I kind of created when React Native was 0 0.5. And so that's been like a total nightmare when I was trying to get through the updates and, you know, at the time of big changes like the require or import syntax, but I had to rewrite almost whole project. That was hard. So in, in that matter, I feel like the project is slowly stabilizing and, and kind of focusing on a, a future and back fixing. Um, so I've been doing change logs um, for the releases as well, uh, recently with the help of, of the community. And so um, I would say that um, back in the day, there used to be way more commits that were sort of uh, focused on, the plat on, on each of the platforms itself. So, for instance, when we were releasing React Native 0. I don't know, let's say 47, I would have to go write a change log where half of the commits were iOS and the other half were Android, right? And then, uh, as the new releases were coming up, uh, and if you look at the change log of the current release, you'll see that uh, not only most of the commits are now sort of related to general platform uh, sort of experience, but also you'll see that we actually decided to drop the platform specific, specific uh, change of format in order to focus on the features rather than the platform in the first place, which is sort of a move towards what React Native really was from the very beginning, which is a cross-platform framework, right? So rather than sort of focusing on, on, on platforms that it supports, we wanted to put more emphasis on the fact that it's universal and focus on features for all the platforms rather than um, what each of the platforms is having on its own. So I'd say that that really makes me excited that I can see that that there is like a move towards the universal uh, universal paradigm, and I can see that it's not only uh, visible within the client projects and the work that we do in the community, but also the framework itself is shifting more towards uh, targeting features and issues that are uh, you know sort of touching all the platforms that it has. So that's kind of interesting. So how are you seeing the momentum as far as um, contributors and, and uh, things like that and issues on React Native, the entire project, like now as compared to maybe a year, year and a half or two years ago? 
Is there any like major change or is it staying consistent or is it dropping off? So I got to say that for the past months, I've been kind of um, less active with the pull requests and issues, which has been purely because of um, work work balance that has been sort of uh, hard to, to keep with. Uh, however, uh, you know, it's like, it's very hard to answer with one sentence. That, that's at least how I feel about it. Uh, last year has been, in my opinion, a year where a lot of people that I know personally were shifted from one company to another or quitting Facebook, which ended up in, in their contributions being obviously smaller and less regular. And I think we all remember, you know, people like Martin who were uh, working on on, on, on on like Android stuff. And, and, and by the way, if, if Martin is listening right now, uh, I wanted to thank him for, for his contributions. Um, and so like, he's just an example. And, 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 and that was, that, that's what I've observed. And, and a lot of people keep asking me like whether React Native is safe, given that people like, it seems like Facebook is sort of, um, decreasing its, um, commitment to the framework itself. Uh, but that's just the one side of the medal, right? If we look at what happens within the uh, within the within the pull requests issues and, and and features and the ecosystem itself, I'm pretty sure we'll get to talking about this in details later. But I feel quite excited. I feel like the the momentum is is, is sort of increasing, given that a lot of companies that I'm talking to, um, the corporate companies, big companies. Are sort of starting to invest in React Native, are starting to look into the open source build and trying to contribute back some changes and updates. And so that's for me a, a very interesting thing. And, and it's good that there are companies that, that we can rely on, right? Because it's definitely easier to use React Native if you know that people from Facebook or Facebook itself or other big company um, is using it, right? Because that's sort of a guarantee that in case things go wrong, and one of the major leading companies decides to sort of stop its commitment. There, there is still going to be a company that can, that you can trust will sort of try to take over what's left and, and kind of get things delivered. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I did notice, uh, you know, some of that churn last year. A lot of the people have been, uh, it seems like, at React, I mean, I'm sorry, at Facebook for quite a bit, or they have been working on the project for, for quite a while. Um, I also did notice that... Um, um, one big one big pickup that, that they did have was uh, Parish Room um, Nasari Ram um, from Microsoft, who had been doing a lot of cool tooling uh, at Microsoft, like Code Push. Um, they they actually um, he actually moved to Facebook, and he's working with React Native. I'm, I'm not really aware of any other like um, big moves for people actually working full time on on the project. I would kind of be interested in kind of finding out more about that, but I'm definitely. The community involvement, um, I do as well kind of see, you know, a lot of activity there. But one of the big things I've kind of noticed in the last year, like you mentioned, was a lot of corporate entities like corporations and large companies that um, may have been skeptical before moving to React Native and kind of spending a lot of resources and betting a lot of their future, you know, engineering manpower, I guess, on React Native. So um, that's that's definitely a good a good sign in general. So another thing is if you look at like like I can tell this from 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 my let's say consultancy perspective because because uh, obviously like just for reference I work at the company that does React Native and React for clients and so um, when we when, when we co-founded Goldstack three years ago we even just like one of very few companies out there I guess like maybe three companies doing React Native that were kind of public about it. And so when I look at the state of the community right now in my country, I can see that a lot of companies are now using React Native or at least offering React Native services to other companies as well. So for me, the last year has been also a great a great development in the area of other companies within Europe that decided to use React Native, discovered it, and, and, and sort of adapted it. And that is quite exciting. I'm really interested how this will look like in this year. Uh, but just from my own experience, I can see that I can see way more requests from local community, way more meetups. And generally interesting, knowing React Native, uh, is just bigger, which I can see at least from, from the conference that we've been organizing, which is sort of targeting developers from that particular region. 
Yeah, also, um, as you mentioned, uh, the conference, you know, in 2017, we saw the first React Native conferences pop up. There was two, you know, of course, React Native EU, the one that Callstack and, and you organized, and then there was Chain React. And I think I saw another one that's going to be out in 2018. I forgot the exact um, name of it, but there's another conference. I believe it's in Europe in 2018 that's React yeah. Native. There was one in Kiev. I, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce the name in Ukraine. Uh, at the end of March, um, yeah, React Native Camp, I guess that's the name. So that's the, at least one that I'm aware of. Yeah. So have you have you all re- uh, announced the date yet for React Native EU 2018? Uh, yep. Yeah, I so so the date will be. Um, let me just quickly check uh, on the website because because I just don't want to miss misinform anyone. Um, so the, the the conference is taking place on fifth and sixth of of September, uh, with workshops on, on, on 3rd and 4th of, of, of September as well. So I'd say it's, it's almost the same time as last year. I think beginning of September is the day that works pretty well for us, uh, given what we like to do. Um, yeah, so we are just in the middle of, 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 of preparing the details and, uh, and sort of nailing out where is the, where is the conference going to take place. But we got a lot of exciting ideas in mind. Um, that's, that's also one thing that kind of excites me about React in general. Like I've never, I've never done, like I've never went to any conferences outside of JS and, and React Realm. So I can't really relate how React conferences compare to, to the other industries. Maybe you, maybe you have some ideas. Um, but from my experience, like every React conference that I go to uh, puts a lot of value into like community, um, some activities. Um, generally things like after party. So, so there is always something going on. These conferences have themes. They are kind of very, very like well thought and marketed. And so we wanted to kind of do the same. And, 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 and the reason I'm saying this is that, um, the last year has been quite successful for us as far as the after party that we did and, and all the events. And for this year as well, we'll try to do some crazy stuff as well. Uh, we like, you know, uh, Projecting glasses on on top of paints and stuff like that, so it's gonna be fun. And I'm not sure like what you think about it, but I'm really excited that conferences like this exist because essentially that's how we can connect with each other, and, and that's I guess how we met um, on the conference. Yeah. So um, as far as the conference is concerned and other communities, I, I was big into like Angular before I got into React, and I was also kind of attending just regular JavaScript conferences. And I can say that really across the entire JS ecosystem, they've all been consistently kind of thoughtful as far as like being um, being able to kind of bring the bring everyone together um, when the conference is over or during breaks, you know, like having parties and, and just um, events around like connecting people. So I would say like in general, like uh, React kind of uh, goes along with some of the other stuff I saw in the JS ecosystem. Um, Equally, you know, it seems really, really a nice, you know, environment for me, at least uh, between all these other conferences as well. Um, but in, in general, you know, since you work a lot with a lot of different companies um, and kind of that's what I've done as well over the last year. Have you seen any any change kind of in their um, in their mentality as far as like what they're kind of spending their money on as far as like development from last year until this year, uh, you know, not only with the React and React Native, but just in general? Well, obviously, I, I've observed quite a lot of changes. Some of them were positive. Uh, one thing one thing which, which really makes me happy because this topic is very close to my heart and, and the company itself is that with every month, there are more clients and generally more people interested in, in creating universal apps, which I think is great uh, because essentially that's why I think React Native makes sense for, for a lot of developers. And and the other thing that I've observed is that there, there, is, there, there is sort of increase uh, of, of corporate companies interested in that React Native. And, and what they are trying to do in particular, is they're trying to integrate their apps, existing native apps with React Native. So that opens a lot of interesting possibilities on how to sort of um, integrate React Native with existing native app. 
how to make all the life cycles play well. It's still a topic that we are kind of discovering on per case basis, but that's what I've observed. And obviously the, the last thing, which is really interesting, is that uh, people are actually interested to get like um, others to teach their teams how to react native in React. I'm pretty sure now that you can relate on this because uh, you've been uh, doing uh, some trainings. I'm not sure, Spencer, if you too, I think you've been doing something or am I wrong? Yeah, I do uh, online training primarily yeah. just through online courses. Yeah, so uh, at least I can say that I've observed way more requests. Honestly, that which is kind of funny. Uh, January was the first month where we had like more workshop requests than services. Which really surprised me because that's been the first month in the entire history of the company that such a situation situation did happen. Is there like a particular type of application that you find a lot of these companies that are you know interested in workshops? Like, what is it that they're typically leaning towards, um, like wanting to teach people or even like the projects you're working on? Uh, through call stack, like through your consultancy, is there certain trends that you see in the technologies or what they're, they want to accomplish types of applications they're typically building with this stack? Mm, sure. So, so I, I, the, the, the most, the, the biggest group, um, the biggest group is the corporate companies that are sort of having their internal infrastructure that they have made over the course of past years, which is sort of native, let's say, um, and what they are trying to do is they're trying to explore the opportunities of integrating React Native with their existing stack and where are the benefits. So what they are trying to put a particular emphasis on is not just how to use React Native, like how to create a view or something, but how to integrate with existing app, how to create a native module, how to create a view manager, uh, how's the, how does the bridge works, how to hug on the bridge, like <clears throat> how to have two separate instances and stuff. So deeply low level stuff, and I call this advanced React Native training. That's, that's how I always refer to it. And, and the teams that join this workshop are essentially senior developers or just developers that, that have major background in, in other languages like C++, Objective C, which is, uh, which is good because they already know iOS. Um, so that's the biggest group. Like that's what I that's what ha, that's what I observed last year, because um, the other group which just looks for React Native training or React training has been there around forever. Like from the very beginning, there's been interest in these workshops that we do during conferences and such. But as far as the corporate companies interested in that particular low level stuff, um, I feel like this is something that's just beginning to happen, which probably makes sense because for them React Native is still kind of new, so. They are at the the time of playing around with that, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think there's like a massive opportunity actually in the market. If you're like listening and you want to kind of find your niche, specializing in helping uh, companies move from or or integrate existing native apps into React Native, that is by far the number one um, concern and request I have from a lot of the corporate companies I've worked with. And these companies have like massive budgets and, and you could probably do really well um, as far as like billing and, and things like that. And, and there aren't a lot of people doing it. I know Mike, uh, they, they, they specialize there, uh, there at Callstack. Um, also Harry Torby um, and maybe a handful of other people. But most of the people that are knowledgeable enough to do this type of stuff are actually working at other companies full time. So it's hard to find the specialists that are kind of... Um, knowledgeable enough about this information and really yeah between the different types of trainings harry uh, i'm sorry mike mentioned the advanced react native training and that's kind of what um he's 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 done both you know i believe just regular you know beginner stuff as well as advanced i haven't done really a lot of advanced stuff a lot of my trainings actually all of my trainings have been either beginning or uh intermediate level stuff but most of the time um the companies have a group of developers that is mix a mixture between completely novice as far as uh, React is concerned, um, all the way up to like people that have done a lot of maybe React on the web but never React Native, um, and then in in between like you know as well as those people in the classroom, there, there's usually quite a bit of native developers that are kind of coming into 
JavaScript for the first time and learning all of the nuances and things like that with JavaScript and ES6. And um, as as far as like the the difference between Android and iOS developers, I've actually noticed maybe 75% of the developers that are attending that are native developers are actually Android developers with only a smaller portion being, being iOS developers. But a lot of the value that um, I think that I've been able to bring, not only with the, the basic advanced, I mean, the basic uh, React Native stuff, but, but also actually just learning JavaScript and being able to kind of teach the ES6 flavor of JavaScript that they're going to be seeing in documentation. That seems to have been um, really um, in demand over the last year. Um, so really everything from small to medium-sized startups to really Fortune 500 companies, I'm seeing that demand kind of be consistent across across the board there. It's very interesting. I'm curious, like this is mostly for me because I come from a web background. I've never done uh, any like real native development. But, you know, as someone who is versed in JavaScript in that environment, but is interested in, you know, the more advanced things you can do with using going into Objective-C or Swift and uh, Java and Kotlin uh, on the respective platforms. As a JavaScript developer, are there any resources or ways of thinking or ways to approach getting into native development um, just to like make React Native apps that kind of like go beyond what you can do when you have to deal with the bridge um, and just kind of getting into that realm eventually even maybe like contributing to React Native Core to uh, build these experiences that work on both iOS and Android? So I, I think that's a really good question. Um, that, that's something that I've been always, there is something that I've been always um, saying, which is um, I feel like React Native community in general would, have, would benefit from having more developers that have native knowledge, native background. Just because uh, obviously the front end layer of React Native is JavaScript and React. But there is a huge amount of native code below. And that huge native code has to be understood and has to be maintained. Uh, and we need people with that knowledge to sort of perform these tasks. And that is also the reason why a lot of issues are hanging around and no one actually has time to implement them because every request or every issue that there, that there, that there is in React Native repo has some relation to native code and, and, and having the understanding and the overview of the platform and, and the way it works, where are the life cycles, gives a lot of opportunities to contribute back to the framework. Um, I'm not really sure what's the best way to learn uh, or approach native development. I can, I, can, I can tell you my story, how I learned iOS. And, 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 and that was, that was before React Native came, that was before I started using React Native, but I believe that's how I was able to sort of nail down a lot of um, paradigms of React Native. So I decided to buy a book, um, which, which is called The Big Nerd Ranch Guide, and I'm pretty sure we can drop a link to it uh, later. And I'm going to tell you, this book has like 15 chapters, which is just about to guide you through the process of setting up your code, ending up with the fully-fledged App Store deployment on iOS. I, I dropped this book at, the, at, at like chapter eight because I decided that I'm not I'm not be like following the book because at that point I, I felt like I'm doing faster than they are explaining, and so I decided to write my own app. So I would say um, for someone to get get deeper into React Native to understand, like if you are doing React uh, React Native with JavaScript and you feel like you don't necessarily realize what's going on there and you'd like to have some confidence. Kind of comfort, comfort understanding what's going on. I'd suggest you learn uh, the iOS platform by, for example, reading this book. Maybe not necessarily how to program a native app, but at least try to sort out the language, the syntax, simple constructions, and most importantly, try to understand the life cycle of the app. So try to understand how iOS app behaves, what are the background modes, how, how is that the iOS app can actually play music even though there is no background mode for iOS. Try to understand the scheduling, how, for example, alarms get triggered, what is the background fetch, and then you will understand how does the React Native headless JS works because you now know how the, how the, um, 
how the how the scheduler works on native side, and then you will realize that these things actually make sense. For example, you can learn about native layouts. You can learn how does the auto layout works on iOS, layouts on Android, and then you will realize why Yoga is great and how does Yoga compare to these solutions. And as a last thing, you can also learn the 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 the, the, the controls. So, for instance, you can read something about um, like the text the view, stuff like that on Android and iOS. And then you will realize way more things like you will no longer be complaining about overflow hidden, uh, overflow visible work not working on Android because you will understand that this is actually a native platform limitation. So I'd say instead of learning how to build the app, because I myself couldn't build Android or iOS app probably right now from scratch, try to learn the syntax APIs, um, the controls, just be aware of what's going on. Because every time you will be about to write a native module with React Native, the app will be already there for you. What you will have to focus on instead is how to, for instance, play with the native APIs, how to sort of listen for some changes. And then you will realize that all that sort of native code that we are talking about with React Native is actually quite simple. And it's just a subset of a sort of native development that you would have with iOS. But that's what I would recommend. Because a lot of people are, for instance, complaining that Xcode or Android Studio are quite bad and we should kind of use a unified sort of editor for all the code. Which is somehow true, but on the other hand, these tools have a lot of features. And the thing is, if we don't know how to use them because we don't know they exist, then we don't know what we are missing out of them. So I'd say that would be my step to recap Try to re- read this book, for instance, just just five, first five or six chapters, um, and then uh, things will go smoothly. Which book um, is that? Uh, this is the, the Big Nerd Ranch Guide. Oh uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been the most recommended book that I've ever I've ever heard of, and uh, honestly, like I, I'm very skeptical about reading from books and generally reading like. I'm very skeptical that I, like, I feel like I can't keep up with, like, with videos and stuff. I just feel like I'm, I'm not, like, uh, let's say, um, focused enough to follow what's going on. But this book has been the first one that actually worked for me. Um, so I'd suggest to try it out if you haven't yet, because I feel like that would be my take if I would be about to learn native development again. So does any of the knowledge transfer between the two platforms? So, for instance, if you do kind of start studying the iOS development and you learn how to kind of do the integration for like a single view maybe into an existing iOS app, uh, and then maybe you learn how to do bridging, will any of that knowledge transfer to Android? Well, I mean, obviously not the the app life cycle and, and things like, things like this because these platforms are totally different. However, um, things like the bridge and the concept in general doesn't really change. And I think that is the very precious value, the experience that you get. Because essentially, when you start working on native modules on iOS and you start integrating with some APIs, you will observe that the Android API is very similar. It's just that it has some differences, which are because of Java or because of Android platform. But the concept itself is the same. And I started with iOS because iOS for me was easier and, and I just knew it, right? So that was very obvious for me that I'll try writing native module on iOS first. And then I decided to go with Android and, and things were way more easier for me than the previous time that I tried just because I had the concept in my mind. I knew how the bridge is going to work probably more or less. I knew where to look for the code snippets and stuff. So what I did is I, I went for the source code of Android. Uh, or React Native on Android, and I learned how these things are implemented. And and this is also one one thing that is worth highlighting, which is very surprising, um, is that the React Native Android version source code has a ton of documentation, which is not even like on the website. It's just it's just inline comments on all the classes. And in order to understand pretty much any part of React Native on Android, you just have to go to the source code and read the docs. It's like there is like a whole explanation of life cycle of examples and stuff like that. So if you look up anything that you use with native modules, you'll find an answer. What's that doing? And most importantly, why it's doing it that way. 
That's really great. I just just ordered that uh, Big Nerd Ranch guide. I'm gonna finally dive into iOS development. <laughs> understand what's going on there. You can't go wrong, I guess, with that choice. Yeah, and those guys actually uh, do really, really, really good training as well. From what I understand, iOS and Android boot camps and things like that. Um, I'm actually on their website right now, just kind of getting an idea. So it looks like they have these five-day boot camps. They're not cheap, but from what I hear, they're like the best. So like maybe around $4,200 for like a five-day uh, on-site training. So it looks like they have iOS with Swift, Android, advanced iOS. Yeah. Actually, that mentioning Swift brings up a, another question. Um, so React Native, looking at iOS, that's primarily written in Objective C. Um, mm-hmm. Like looking forward, obviously, like a lot of new material around iOS development is in Swift. Is there, like, what what's the trade off? Or, I mean, even like, what's the reasoning that React Native is written in Objective C versus Swift? Because Swift was around when um, React Native kind of started. And I guess I'm just not clear on that. Like, I, I remember faintly reading the reasoning why that is, but. Um, it's just something I'm not familiar with. I think there could be some 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 deeply technical um, reasons why this happened that way. Uh, but I think that the, the 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 like that's that's how I think Facebook could play it is um, essentially you know at the time of writing um, React Native, Objective C was probably dominant language within Facebook, and mm-hmm. and it, and it just made sense for them to use it. Um, cause that's what they've been using. Or it could be even simpler that the team that was working on React Native in the first place just were, just was more comfortable with it. Um, uh, to be honest, like, if, if we look at the very first issues of React Native, there is a lot of discussions as to where, whether to use this tool or, or not, including, uh, first attempts to integrate Webpack, uh, that failed. Um, which points me to question that there could have been an attempt to do it that way. And, and maybe there were some performance reason, reasons or infrastructural limitations at the time of writing that just couldn't be, just couldn't be sort of done. But essentially, I think that the answer is just simple that Facebook has the Objective-C widely implemented. They have infrastructure around it. They have tools. They have apps. And, and the Swift versus Objective-C interop Right now, it's still a bit um, sort of hacky if we look at how how long does it take to do it with React Native. Um, maybe not hacky, but complex. And so, three years ago, uh, I think that was way more, um, way more, way harder, right? So, mm-hmm. probably it's just a, a lot of different reasons why it happened. Anyway, um, taking this forward. Um, that there is like a, a question that is very tempting to a lot of people, which is w- whether I should learn Objective-C right now, because Swift is dominant language, right, these days. It's no longer a question whether to learn this or that. I mean, that's that, that that's what I've been asking myself two years ago, whether to go with Swift or Objective-C. Uh, right now, I feel like everyone is going Swift direction, which is, which is great. And a lot of people are actually sort of interested whether they should even learn it. Um, if you are planning to work within the React Native community, then then you gotta do it, right? I mean, you can potentially use Swift within React Native, but the interop is, is kind of complex in a way that it it is very hard. I mean, not very hard, but I've seen people having a lot of troubles getting that set up right, including myself. Um, so that's why I've been always very very skeptical about integrating it. However, I'd say that if you plan to work on React Native or within the React Native ecosystem, you, you gotta learn it. Just, just simple, just simple syntax and, and, and you will be there. Essentially the, the, the UI kit and all that things that are very important. They don't change. So, um, learning Objective C just for the sake of doing React Native would probably make sense for you. But if you are just about to start React Native or writing native modules and you do not plan to contribute to the community where uh, Objective C is used, then probably doesn't make sense. Um, it's just trade-offs, so you got to check whether you want to spend time working on that and potentially 
risk using a language that you will no longer be able to use apart from React Native. So that's the question everyone has to, I guess, answer. I, I got I got time at that time uh, to do it, and that's why I took the risk. But yeah. Yeah, and I guess like the the concepts you're going to learn, regardless of you know which language you do, you're still yeah. learning iOS development. So you know, even if you want to start on the, and I put in air quotes, the easier language of Swift, which is more familiar to me at least, as someone who's primarily got experience with JavaScript, like the concepts you're going to learn, um, kind of like understanding how iOS works, or you know on the Android side how Android works, you can always pick up a different language and that different syntax to uh, pull those different pieces together and actually contribute to React Native open source or whatever it may be. So what about um, switching gears to other things that kind of happened in 2017? We kind of saw um, a upshift in the chatter and the adoption of Reason. What do you think about Reason as far as like it being a viable solution to kind of build client apps and also like where do you see that technology headed over the next year or two? I haven't been using Reason yet, so I can't really relate here. Um, primarily, I, I've been looking at it uh, from a perspective of Ocaml developer because that's what they taught me at the university. Um, <clears throat> The biggest problem that I had with, with Reason so far, and, and, and the reason why I didn't use it yet, is that, uh, I mean, if I'm making some stupid mistake, then please correct me. But when I was trying to use React Native with Reason, that there are these um, Reason React Native bindings kind of thing. Uh, and the problem was that I wanted to use a version that was different than the bindings. Uh, for, like the bindings were made for a different version, that was one thing. And the second, which was like a deal breaker for me, was that the bindings were not complete. So they covered like the majority of the APIs. But I, I just needed to use the particular ones that I were not supported. I mean, maybe not at the time of launching the product, but I was afraid that I'll, I'll need to use them. And I was afraid of, of, of doing that because my, my reason knowledge was limited, that I felt like I will not be able to do the bindings myself. Uh, so that was why I didn't, I didn't start the project yet. Maybe that'll change this year. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to hear what you think about this. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. I mean, my knowledge, of course, is not that, that in-depth either, uh, but we have had a few discussions here, and I've actually talked about Reason quite a bit over the last year and looked into it. But, um, you know, Essentially, it's just another abstraction on top of of an of an abstraction on top of an abstraction, and it's just you know it starts getting you know more and more complex. And um, I think as the ecosystem matures, those bindings will either become more consistent and mature, or I know there's talk of actually compiling Reason directly down to native code and like skipping the whole JavaScript part. But essentially, you know what is happening, at least to my understanding, is the OCaml is being compiled to BuckleScript, which then compiles to JavaScript, which then you know powers your React Native app. Is that is that kind of right, Mike? Yeah, I think I think that's how it's done. Um, because the great thing about OCaml sort of its infrastructure on a very very high level uh, is that it's sort of pluggable, like like the Normally, where you have the the parser, like server compiler and stuff, it's just one thing that you can replace with OCaml. It's it's kind of easy to replace it and hack on top of that, and that's how Reason can actually replace the target. The the target can be replaced and actually be a buckle script. So that's right. And actually, you could be writing OCaml for web. So it would be just like reason, but without the reason syntax. So it's just to say that the infrastructure has been there for, for, for a long time. I guess developers at Bloomberg were the ones that were originally experimenting with that. And so they made all the, all that. They will, they, they, they kind of preferred all the background with the community together to allow the other abstractions to happen. So it could be, yeah, that, that, that I think you are right with this, but probably some reason ML 
specialists uh, that we have on Twitter and, 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 and subscribe to this podcast will probably have some interesting highlights as well. Yeah, we need to have another episode on Reason, actually. Hopefully someone yeah. um, can come on in the next couple of months and give us an update, because I think it's probably been about a year since we had someone on talking about Reason. And that was really at the very beginning of all, all the hype that we've seen over the last year. So now we should have um, a better, you know, a better like ecosystem of things to talk about, whereas back then it was kind of brand new. Um, and also this year, you know, GraphQL is not a new thing at this point. It's been around for a couple of years, but I feel like the momentum over the last year has actually just gotten very, very significant. Um, we're seeing a lot of like real companies picking it up, just like React Native. Um, I know that, um, you know, I've been working some with Amazon and I work with Amazon now. They've released AppSync, which is kind of like uh, Firebase, but for GraphQL. And then there's GraphQL that kind of happened over the last year, which is a similar service. And then, of course, the Apollo team is doing a lot of cool stuff. But, and, but the big thing I'm seeing is actually companies, when they're thinking about building a new app, actually using GraphQL as, um, as part of their data layer. Have you seen that, Mike? Yeah, so... First thing is that when you say we, GraphQL has been around for a few years, I feel like I'm getting old. Uh, I'm, I'm still kind of I'm still young, right? Because I'm 24, and and I remember um, I was on the conference where, where GraphQL got sort of um, announced, and I feel like that's been just yesterday. <laughs> So when I hear like a couple of years, I feel like, oh man, that's been a long time. So I guess 2015, I just looked up the date because I didn't know. And now it's 2015. <laughs> so yeah, so as of, as of this month, I could say yeah, a couple time, of years. <laughs> the first passing. stable release was actually 2016, it looks like. Nice. Yeah. So to be honest, I feel like the last year GraphQL developed quite well. I, I didn't have time to play around with GraphQL last year at all. And and now when I just got back to check it, I felt like so many great things did happen there. So one thing that I can tell you about, which is really exciting for me, because I'm planning to get my next project built on it, uh, is actually the HWS thing that you mentioned, the AppSync. So apart from another set, I think that one killer feature of AppSync that really makes me excited is the fact that AppSync can expose a GraphQL interface for anything that you want. Starting from a custom database that you have, you just write your schema and boom, things work. Ending up with, even with a custom Lambda function for things that go beyond the serverless infrastructure. Say the database queries are not, not enough, you want to write your custom mutation. That's great. And for production use cases, it even has the access control list. So when I, when I saw it, like, I'm kind of, kind of pessimistic and skeptical when I see like new product launching. Uh, these days, especially a software as a service, platform as a service thing. But when I saw this, I was like, this is what I want to use. Because uh, it directly maps to what I'm looking for as a developer working for bigger companies. So I'm really excited to try it out and, and see how it's going to sort of work. Um, yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. I'm really excited for the next year, for this year. Uh, for GraphQL, I feel like for me, it's going to be a huge development. Um, as far as the community, I haven't even I haven't actually dived into it yet. So apart from um, apart from my friend uh, Peggy that joined Apollo GraphQL last year, I don't really know any major updates. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Well, um, we kind of talked about navigation recently, so we won't really dive into that too much. But uh, really, you know, as of right now, still it's kind of the same. You know, as we talked about before, I think, um, you know, React Navigation as the community effort and then React Native Navigation from Wix as like an open source um, native solution. Is that kind of still, uh, in your opinion, Mike, because me and Spencer actually just had a long discussion about this on, a few, uh, on an earlier episode, but is that kind of what you kind of also are seeing as like the two main solutions? Yeah, I mean... That's definitely the, the most popular solutions from what we've, what we've been implementing for our clients. Uh, I myself, I've been always promoting OX navigation just because it's been more stable for me. Um, not saying a better one, but 
definitely more stable for, for what I was needing back then. Um, but yeah, these, these two have been the most, the most popular ones so far that I've seen. Obviously, React Navigation had its own issues, and I think, uh, I think Spencer might have more updated information on that because I haven't been contributing to React Navigation for like a few months, I guess. Um, but what I'm really interested and excited about for React Navigation, basically, like, like the first, the first problem with React Navigation was that there was never like a dedicated team to work on it full time. Um, people were joining, people were leaving, but until, up until like a few months, uh, there's been like a, like a gap. So now that there is a, a stable team that is taking care of issues and doing the development, and now that we have the request that the repository for proposals where people can finally, um, suggest their improvements is great. With Eric joining the team, um, Who's been like one of the, one of the fathers of the navigation world, uh, within the React Native. I see a bright future ahead and, uh, I'll be planning on get, getting back to the, de- to the development of React Navigation as well in my free time. And that, that, that's really, that's really what makes me excited. The, that, that change in the project management and how does, how does the development is going to look like? Cause if you look at the React Navigation issues, uh, a lot of them were just sort of, stale. Um, if you look at, for example, issue that was opened last year by Satya, I guess, uh, which is about implementing events, uh, like is focused, um, will blur, did blur and stuff. That issue has been open for a long time and had hundreds of comments and people just couldn't reach the compromise, the common ground. And that issue is a perfect example of, like there were more issues like this, where we couldn't just reach a consensus on what has to happen. And so the, 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 the request for proposal for proposal to resolve this problem, because we agreed uh, that the focus feature will be landing in a form that, that makes everyone happy. And I feel like this just happened like yesterday or maybe today. So I feel like this is, is, is the new quality for React Navigation. Makes me really excited and makes me really want to get back to contributing to it because I can see that project is finally unblocking. That there is finally like those old issues that were stale because we couldn't reach an agreement are finally landing and there is bright future ahead of the project with, 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 with the team, full time team on it. Um, so I think that React Navigation can actually do some, some, so like can probably affect uh, the balance of navigations in this year. So I don't know if we meet next year, uh, whether I'll still be saying that it's either React Navigation or Wix. Probably, maybe next year there's going to be just one. Um, that would, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing. That would be great, really. I mean, I, uh, you hate to see, see time spent on any project wasted, but in reality, convening on one solution is better for everyone, you know, if we can find something. And I agree with everything you just said. Exactly. Plus, the great thing about React Navigation that, that Eric told me, but we never actually got around, was that React Navigation could be a set of primitives for, for native navigation as well. So technically speaking, you could do native navigation with the React Navigation API, which is nice. Um, so that is also worth sort of experimenting with. And so there are a lot of JavaScript navigations popping up. Uh, these days, like, just like last month, Satya showed me, um, React router, uh, navigation flags or something like this, which is like a, a new thing, a new kid on the block. Um, uh, and it's great. It has great API. It works nice. Uh, it's just a React router wrapper, uh, for React native. Problem is, mm, the author of the library had to implement the, the header himself, I guess, or use a third party library. The thing is, it's very hard to replicate those controls in JS. People always say that JS navigations will never be good because we are replicating the, the, the interaction. So that's why we spend a lot of time within React navigation. I've been working on the, on the header. Then Skivy was working on the animations. He's been messing around with this uh, spring, uh, animations and making sure that the header looks exactly as native one. He even posted that on Twitter when he compared the, 
the native one and the React navigation one, and people couldn't really uh, guess the, the differences. So, so React navigation has this opportunity to be that primitives that other navigations can use. So if someone wants to, for instance, do the React router navigation, they could have just used the, the React navigation header, right? And, and get all that benefit or all that hours we spend on mastering the header to look like native rather than going to the code and creating that header himself, going for the same mistakes or the same limitations that we did go through. Right, so that's where I also see a great opportunity for React navigation this year. Yeah, the project is not definitely going to die. The name is too cool. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. And uh, earlier you mentioned in your free time, and I I started laughing to myself because I know you, and I know you don't have any free time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's actually one of my biggest problems recently, which is time management. Uh, I still haven't figured out how to solve it, uh, but, you know, that's the problem that you have when you're working on a sort of business-related uh, position. So I see React Navigation as an escape hatch for me to stay technical and technically relevant. Uh, and, you've all, than, you know, and you've just, already spent a lot of, I mean, you were one of the original, like, maintainers. I mean, you, you, you had a a lot of activity there, you know, in the past. So it's not like a brand new thing for you or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I decided to drop on purpose because I had uh, just other projects to take on and my capacity for open source activities is sort of limited. Um, but now that I've finished quite a few things, we shipped Hall and we shipped other products. Uh, I might be having some time to sort of um, maybe jump there for, for a moment and help um, Eric and the new team uh, get through some issues. Um. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll see. Right. So the last topic before we wrap it up is um, Expo. Expo has been just just wildly active in the last year in React Native. They've done a ton of cool things. I know that um, Snack was, I think, was kind of something that happened this year. Maybe I'm mistaken, but um, I know they've done um, a lot of a lot of. Um, they've had a lot of demos that were built using Expo that have helped me a lot, like people in the community, um, and they've been super active. But um, yeah, so definitely um, Expo is something kind of that we've seen continuing. You know, they've been around for a couple of years too, believe it or not. But, um, you know, in the last year, they've definitely continued their momentum. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I start every one of my uh, React Native projects with Expo now, and like that wasn't the case a year ago. Um, but just the platform that they've put together, it's just, it's so easy to get started. And I even noticed like a drastic difference between the amount of time it takes to start the packager and get the app running on my simulator when running Expo versus, um, just kind of like starting out a, a new project just because like they're taking care of a lot of stuff just to make it that much easier for someone like me who doesn't have that native experience and like isn't really going to tap into those uh, more into go into that iOS or Android project um, that comes with React Native. It's just it's made development really easy, really quick, and you can just iterate so quickly with it. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that's 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 great. And and, and honestly, I think that Expo is the best thing that happened to our community. Not just because they could they create great tools. It's 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 also because and most importantly, they are great people and friends. Mm -hmm. and, and and what they are doing is just is just impressive. Like every single issue that I'm working on, they are just there. Like I'm not sure if I could be doing all that stuff that I'm doing with releases of React Native if it wasn't for Expo people that helped me. Uh, for instance, James, the CTO there, um, he's been doing releases uh, way before I did it. Uh, he's been working at Facebook as well, and, and, and like he worked on the infrastructure. And so up until today, uh, we, we often talk about like, a lot of issues that, that happen within React Native. And they are always the ones that think. They are always the ones who sort of pursue that the fix to land. So um, I, I just love their commitment to what they are doing because they are highly focused on getting React Native sort of perform well because that's what they are using internally. So that's that's also what I love about them. The, the fact they are just around and they can help us uh, with the growth. Yes, and... Um Exactly. Like I'm just blown away at the amount of product productivity that they the team has. They just are bringing on 
you know, some of the most talented people in the world and putting them, you know, right into the smack middle of, of React Native and, and all the things going on there. Not only, like you mentioned, like for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the entire community. And if you haven't been on their website lately, they actually recently updated or revamped their website the last few months. And it's really, really nice and it's easy to get around. And you, and you may learn something that you haven't seen if you haven't been there in a while. And um, check it out, expo.io. So um, I think that kind of brings us uh, to the end on time. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started with the picks. So uh, Spencer, I'll start with you. Do you have any picks today? Yeah, uh, my pick's going to be kind of like a, a personal promotion, but um, I've got an email list and it's available at workreactnative.com. And basically what this is, is I've had quite a few people, typically smaller US-based businesses who want to work with React Native, reach out to me. Um, and I don't have the capacity to take all of this on. So basically, this email list is a way uh, for me to match people who are interested in doing React Native work with people who are interested in uh, hiring React Native developers. So I send out an email every Monday with, you know, three or four job postings that people have posted that week. Um, it's free and it's available at workreactnative.com. Okay, great. Uh, Mike, do you have any picks? To be honest, I haven't prepared any picks for this for this particular uh, podcast yet. However, I do recommend you to keep an eye on the React Native releases. Um, the next one is, is, is going to be up at the end of the month. Uh, and regardless of the month you are listening to this podcast, so that's always going to be accurate. Um, and, and, and maybe it's not a pick, but if you would like to help us with, with the releases, if you'd like to get involved into React Native ecosystem, but you just don't have time to go through issues, uh, feel free to drop me a message on Twitter where you are looking for people to help with uh, preparing the change log and, and, and doing general maintenance work in that area as well. So just let me know if, in case you are interested. I'll be happy to uh, sort of let you know all the steps that you need in order to get up and running. Okay, and uh, for me, I have a couple of picks. Uh, two of them are conferences. Um, one of them is Chain React, which is happening in July. We... Um, Attended Chain React last year. It was awesome. This year, it looks like it's also going to be great. Um, I'm going to be attending. I'm not going to be speaking or anything, so it's going to be fun for me just to kind of be there without too much to worry about, just to be able to go and have fun. Um, and then React Amsterdam is coming up in April. Um, I'll be giving a talk there on virtual reality and augmented reality uh, with Vero. And um, if you want to go to a really fun city and um, just, you know, see and do a lot of React stuff as well as fun stuff. React Amsterdam, I've heard, is a really awesome conference. I've never been. This is going to be my first time. But I really kind of uh, am looking forward uh, to going to it. And my last pick is a Pluralsight course. It's called Getting Started with DynamoDB. Um, and it's by Abaya Chauhan. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, I started with AWS Mobile few uh, about a week ago and I'm kind of getting up up and running with uh, and trying to get really in depth on some of the things um, technologies I'm going to be working with and one of them is DynamoDB so this this course has been just one of the lifesavers that I've had um, as far as like like technical knowledge and things like that it's just been really really good so if you're looking to learn more about DynamoDB I would definitely uh, check out that course and then uh, lastly, you know, I've been keeping up with uh, CallStack over the last year. Um, if you are looking for um, a company to do some consulting with or you need, you need an app built or you need someone to kind of come onto your team, they've brought on some of the best people in, 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 in the React Native community um, over the last year. I know that Matthews um, joined CallStack recently um, as well as just some of the uh, other people that have kind of come on over the last six months or so that I don't really know their names off the top of my head. But yeah, definitely, you know, Mike's company, CallStack, they're really great. And they not only are great about, you know, delivering software, but they're just good people and they've contributed so much to the React Native community. It's kind of like hiring people that are like the experts in the field. And I, and I, I can't highly, recommend them highly enough. <laughs> and that kind of, that, that will kind of end uh, this episode of React Native Radio. So uh, thank you, uh, Spencer, and thank you, Mike, for coming on. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thanks. Great talking to you guys. Yeah, definitely. So this ends, uh, wraps up um, episode 85 of React Native Radio, the first episode of 2018. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.